they can say, look, I'm afraid, I can't do anything else. In free societies, you can't plead fear, you can only plead cowardice. And that's a difference, too. Well, You're, let me tell you just, in, in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, um, the media were controlled. And nobody, we all knew it. There was a department in the Central Committee of the Communist Party called the Department of Agitation Propaganda, later just a propaganda department, and you got your orders. This is what you're going to say about this, how you say it is your business, but this is the line. And every single publication in the country, every single television, every single radio, they followed this line. They were all controlled. But the way you tend to portray the press in this country, at least the, the mainstream press, seems to be pretty similar. It looks like... They're all doing the same thing, oh, and they're all right. controlled well, somewhere. Well, that's it. They, no? they have to distinguish this. Right. In fact, they're all doing the same thing, pretty much, but they're not controlled the same way. Um, there are many different mechanisms that can lead to similar consequences. First of all, again, let me stress, the consequences aren't identical. I mean, the variety in the United States is considerably greater, uh, and uh, the independence is certainly greater. The mechanisms of control are totally different. I mean, the mechanisms of control, if you want to call it that, in the United States are not very, are a kind of guided free market. You know, people are uh, they're responding to pressures that have to do with concentration of power, and concentration of resources, and need for advancement, and so on and so forth. But the and you can spell these things out; they're not very subtle. Uh, but what's interesting is the uniformity of the consequence. So you say that in, let's take say take two invasions: the Russian invasion of Afghanistan and the American invasion of South Vietnam. Now, in the Soviet Union, uh, incidentally, it was recognized as a Russian invasion of Afghanistan, even in the press, but it was defended. Because you had to go into Afghanistan. Never used, in, no, the word invasion was never used. Well, actually, there was I mean, one famous in, initially, but by the early 80s, it was already being used. In fact, oh, it was a famous. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, so a couple of years, within a few years, I mean, it was being used. However, the main, the line that was coming down from the Agitprop Bureau is it's a defense of Afghanistan against terrorists supported by the CIA and the Imperial. We're asked to come You're in and help for a limited Fine. force. Now, let's take the United States. Uh, the United States invaded South Vietnam, attacked South Vietnam, in, certainly no later than 1962. That's when John F. Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnamese villages, uh, authorized the use of napalm, uh, sent American forces into combat situations, and so on. That's an invasion, okay? Then the invasion built up into a huge attack on all of Indochina. All right, that's now, what, 31 years? I, I've, I'm waiting to find some phrase, one phrase in the American press, one. I'm not asking for a lot. One phrase in the whole mainstream press that refers to such an event as the U.S. invasion of South Vietnam. I can't find it. Uh, what you find is, uniformly, the American defense of South Vietnam, maybe unwise, against terrorists supported from the outside. Word by word paraphrase of uh, what the Agitprop Bureau told them. Now, nobody told them that in the United States. Right? They didn't get an order from the government saying that's the way you got to describe it. But nevertheless, that's what the output is. Uh, the only, you take a look. I mean, take, you mentioned Anthony Lewis. He was a critic of the war by 1969 or so. And he never called it an invasion? No, he, he said that the United States, in 1969, year after Wall Street turned against the war uh, and told Johnson to cut it off, uh, Anthony Lewis was writing about how the war began blundering efforts to do good, but by 1969 it had turned into a disaster, mainly for us. Well, you know, I mean, I'm sure there were people in the Politburo who were saying that after a couple of years. Started out with blundering efforts to do good in Afghanistan, but within a few years we saw it was a disaster. I mean, you know, it wouldn't have been a difficult thing for someone to write in Pravda by, you know, 1984 or so. Uh, now, we're talking about 1985. Okay, and easier by 85 after Gorbachev. Okay, yeah, sure. Yes. But uh, so now here the mechanisms are radically different. And so I don't want, I mean, I only mentioned Anthony Lewis because you mentioned him. And scholarship was the same. Uh, so, for example, in, in the scholar, in the academic world, it would have been hard to find someone more critical of U.S. policy in Asia than John King Fairbank, the dean of American Asian scholars. He was considered virtually a communist. You know? Well, he was president of the American Historical Association in 1968. And in December, he gave his presidential address, which, of course, was partly about Vietnam. Uh, and it, he said that uh, uh, it, we, we got into Vietnam in an excess of, uh, disint of benevolence and uh, disinterested uh, kindness or something like that. Uh, but we misunderstood the relation to China and it was sort of an analytical error. The American business community had turned against the war. What about all the, in the years up to that, there was just support for it. But these are not people speaking because they've been told to no, say absolutely. it. They believe it. Exactly. Well, I'm saying the point. mechanisms are totally different. Right. It's the output that is astonishingly similar. Now, what are the mechanisms? Well, then you want to look at them. Well, let's it's give you a chance to... Uh, uh, the mechanisms might have General Electric, yeah. Yeah. the multinational corporation that owns the cable channel on which Professor Chomsky shares his views with us today. We presume our program will make the airwaves without... Effort. Hopefully we will be back. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, one more time, Professor Chomsky. Uh, as I've reviewed uh, not only the documentary, which shows you speaking around the world and talking to just about seeing every reporter in the northern and the southern, gives essentially the same message because why? Why? Yeah. Well, we have to look what the message is. First of all, the message is one of 
of remarkable subordination to power. Now, power in the United States doesn't happen to be in the state. It's not the it's not a centralized military bureaucratic state like in the Soviet Union. Right. Power in the United States primarily lies in corporations and the corporate world. Uh, the, there, there's very uh, uh, narrow concentration of control over resources, over investment decisions, and so on and so forth. And that affects everything. Can't help affecting everything. Uh, it, it affects the government because this means that there's a very close link between governmental power and corporate power. Furthermore, just the ability to make investment decisions and financial decisions places bounds on what any government could do. Yes. Furthermore, it, it, now let's go to the major media. For, what are the major media? Well, they're huge corporations. Okay, the New York Times, Washington Post, NBC, they first of all are large corporations, so quite profitable ones, in fact. Uh, secondly, they're parts of even bigger conglomerates, like, you know, Westinghouse and GE and so on. Now, like any corporation, they sell a product on a market. This is a market, roughly a market, kind of a state-guided market society. Uh, what's the product and what's the market? Well, the market's advertisers, uh, the, that is, other businesses. So they're selling a product to other businesses. Corporations are selling a product to other businesses. What's the product? Well, the product is audiences. Now, for the major media, the ones that kind of set the agenda, they're selling elite audiences, privileged audiences. Uh, the New York Times, say, is targeting privileged elite sectors of the population. That's their audience, and they're trying to sell that audience to other businesses. Uh, now, so we have to begin with, just on you know the most elementary grounds, we have it. We look at a system. Suppose we're Martians. You know, we're looking at this system. We say, okay, here are huge corporations selling privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what picture of the world do you expect to come out of that? Then we begin to add other factors. Uh, if you're, let's say, you're the chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, or you know, a pundit on the op-ed page, and you want to really have important, you know, insights into the government. Well, we all know how that's done. You have lunch with the Secretary of State. He tells you the lies that he wants to appear tomorrow. You write them and you say, a high source in Washington, my intrepid reporting has discovered that a high source in Washington said so-and-so. In fact, if you compare the internal declassified record, you know, say, people like Dean Acheson's decisions, and you look at, say, James Reston's columns, they're pretty close. And the same will be true about uh, James Baker and Thomas Friedman. And furthermore, this is an open secret. We know that this is the way, it's, it's not a big secret in the journalistic and profession. That this is, now, in order to maintain those contexts, you better present the world a certain way, or those contacts are going to be cut off. Uh, you'll you'll lose your opportunity to have uh, to, to appear to have special insight, to have leaks, you know, to uh, be able to come across with the story, you know, a couple hours before the next person, and so on. Plus, you'll you'll now in order there's a, there's an interplay here which requires power in order to maintain your own power. That's another factor over and above the just structural and institutional uh, properties. Go along, you get along. Uh, uh, but, but to those uh, to those wounded mainstream people. Jeff Greenfield of ABC News said you were from Neptune. You're a wacko. Not only that, but it, the majority of people in the Soviet Union by the late 1980s, in fact, before that, would say to you, well, we know that these papers are controlled. Neptune's we weird. know. Well, we ate. Whereas most Americans would say to you, Professor, give me a break. This isn't true. I have a free press. I get all the information I need. The New York, what, are, are Americans less intelligent? We report those? on the pollution of major corporations. Let's, we see, report I, on all these things. And here you are dropping right. this. And but I'm going to give you a chance to answer. You're not... <laughs> You're not allowed to cut us off. I want to impress Professor Chomsky. They won't cut us off if I won't let them. Watch this. You have... uh, from the documentary Manufacturing Consent, uh, a very uh, protracted look at uh, Professor Chomsky's speeches around the world, uh, his statements, uh, and his social criticism, comes forward now a uh, part of an interview that Bill Moyers conducted with none other than uh, Tom Wolf, the author, who uh, responds hmm. to the question that follows uh, Professor Chomsky everywhere he goes. Variously stated, it essentially boils down to who the hell do you think you are? Tom Wolf. This is the, the the old cabal theory that uh, that somewhere there's a there's a room with a baize covered desk and there are a bunch of capitalists sitting around and they're pulling uh, strings. These rooms don't exist. I mean, I hate to tell Noam Chomsky this. You don't you don't you don't share. I think it is the most absolute rubbish I've ever heard. This is the current fashion in the universities. You know, it's patent nonsense, and I think it's it, it's nothing but a fashion. It's a way that uh, intellectuals have of of feeling like a clergy. I mean, there has to be something wrong. Well, I actually agree with that comment. I mean, the idea that there would be a high cabal running things in a country like the United States is idiotic. Well, that would say it is like the Soviet Union. It's totally different, which is precisely why I say the exact opposite. What I, I mean, this, what I'm talking about, it's, it's, it's like saying the corporations try to maximize profit and market share. That's not a conspiracy. That's the institutional structure of the system. Individual yeah, decisions yeah, lead yeah. to that consequence of trying to maximize profit and market share. You don't do it, you're out of business. That's not a conspiracy, and it's not a high cabal. Yeah. Now, why does uh, Wolf, or whoever it was, uh, hear this as being a conspiracy? The point is that any analytic commentary 
on the institutional structure of the country is so threatening to the commissar class. They can't even hear the words. Is he part of the commissar oh, class, Tom Wolf? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't even hear the words. So if I say there yeah. is no high cabal, what he hears is there is a high But don't you think the reason he can't hear the words is because he believes profoundly in the things he's been taught, that this is democracy, that there is freedom. It's like a lot of people like myself who used to be a member of the Communist Party and who profoundly believed in the ideals and very painfully yeah. let go. Don't you think that there are a lot of honest people, Tom Wolf being one of them, who not profoundly saying, believes in this, and he's not a member of the commissar class, he just no, has his no, ideals. Yeah, but you see, what you're, he, when you're threatening, you threaten those but ideas. But see, what you're describing in the Soviet Union is what I would call the commissar class. That is, the people who profoundly believed. I'm sure, you know, I don't know people. people average people. Average people, right. but also all the way up to the editors of Pravda. If you did, a, if you did an in-depth analysis with, with them, how many of them would be total cynics? Not yeah, that's right, because most of them completely believe. That's the way systems work. In fact, if you have, a, I mean, the way belief systems form, really, if you think about it, is, you know, even though it's sort of personalized, you sort of decide to do something for whatever reason, then you create a system of beliefs that justifies it and says, yeah, I was right. Well, the end effect of this is that people who function within a system of power and authority, whether it's a, uh, an editor of Pravda or a, an op-ed writer for the Times or a concentration camp guard or, you know, pick across the board, they're usually quite sincere about it. And they've worked up a system of beliefs that says, yes, this is just right, and I'm completely free and independent. If they couldn't have that system of beliefs, they couldn't continue. Now, the point is when, but I think when you point out that, I, I agree with you when you say it's a tight, closed system of beliefs, it's a kind of fundamentalism, which means you simply cannot hear critical analysis. And it's interesting to see what in the United States can't be heard. Ordinary institutional analysis, which says this is the way institutions function in a guided free market system, given the distribution of power, without any control, no control, you know, nobody's given orders, and so on. This is the way it functions, because of the way power is distributed. That's much too threatening to listen to, just as it's too threatening to hear the words the United States attacks off Vietnam, or the United States orchestrated the monstrous atrocities in Central America for things. It's not allowed. People get very emotional. Because, it's, because there's, there are fundamentalist beliefs involved. And yet, oh, well, well I, then we talk about, we have only about three minutes left. East Timor and Cambodia. May I ask you to briefly make your case there? Well, the case is pretty straightforward. There were, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's as if history set up a controlled experiment. There were two mm -hmm. major atrocities going on uh, at the same time, same part of the world, roughly comparable in scale. One of them was an Indonesian invasion and annexation of another country, East Timor. The other was uh, Pol Pot atrocities internal to Cambodia. Uh, the, coverage, the coverage was dramatically different. Uh, coverage of East Timor declined sharply as the atrocities continued. They, the coverage of East Timor was pretty high before the Indonesian invasion. It then declined and hit zero in ni both the United States and Canada in 1970, and most of the world, the Western world, in 1978, when the atrocities really reached genocidal proportions. And Cambodia, on the other hand, there was huge publicity. Within a few weeks after the Khmer Rouge takeover, the New York Times already denouncing genocide, when probably maybe a few hundred or thousand people had been killed. Well, what was the difference? The difference was, in one case, the United States was directly behind it. It was providing 90% of the arms. It was providing East crucial Timor. diplomatic the support. Invasion, invasion of East Timor. The U.S. Yeah. provided critical diplomatic support. Daniel Moynihan took pride in the fact that he prevented the U.N. from doing any action. He writes about it with great pride. The U.S. gave them new offers of arms. As the, as the attack peaked, Carter sent more arms. In Cambodia, it was an enemy. It, you can be very moral about the atrocities committed by an enemy. May I call your attention to, uh, speaking of East Timor, less than three years ago, Amy Goodman and uh, Alan Nairn, two reporters with whom you're familiar, Ms. Goodman with Pacifica Radio, and uh, NPR, a public uh, su listener-supported radio station, and Alan Cairn of The New Yorker are beaten by troops who are firing on civilians around them as they assemble and march for one of the first... This is less than three years ago. Here is part of that report on radio. I want you to listen to some comment. Just take a moment. The Timorese in an instant were down. It was torn apart by the bullets. The street was covered with bodies, covered with blood, and the soldiers just kept on coming. They poured in one rank after another. They leaped over the bodies of those who were down. They were aiming and shooting people in the back. I could see the limbs being torn, their bodies exploding. There was blood spurting out into the air, uh, the pop of the bullets uh, everywhere. And it was very organized, very systematic. The soldiers did not stop. They just kept on shooting until no one was left standing. A group of soldiers grabbed my microphone and threw me to the ground, kicking and punching me. At that point, Alan threw himself on top of me, protecting me from further injury. The soldiers then used their rifle butts like baseball bats, beating Alan until they fractured his skull. The point with only seconds left is, as, as is made in your documentary, uh, this got coverage, but it wasn't much. I don't think much of it wrong, because let's look at what happened right after that, which has not been covered. The immediate consequence of that is that Western oil companies, uh, under the, with the, uh, following the lead of their governments, uh, entered into agreements with Indonesia to rob Timorese oil. That's exactly as if Libya had entered into an agreement with Iraq to rob Kuwaiti oil after the Kuwaiti invasion. That report is so what uh, determines what the Western media covers. We'll be back next time with Noam Chomsky.